World Can't Wait mobilizes people living in the United States to stand up and stop the war on the world and the torture carried out by the US government. We take action regardless of which political party holds power to expose the crimes of our government, from war crimes to systematic mass incarceration, and to put humanity and the planet first. Founded in 2005 during the Bush regime to halt and reverse the terrible program of war, repression, and theocracy, we continued under Obama and Trump, and now we'll continue under Biden's presidency. We Are Not Your Soldiers officially became a project of World Can't Wait in 2008, and we've been going ever since. I became the coordinator of the project in 2012 after spending my career as a literacy specialist in the New York City public school system. My name is Stephanie Rugop, and I am the moderator of the discussion this evening. We go into high school and college classrooms where the veterans share their experiences in the US military and engage in dialogue with the students, helping to expose imperial wars to a generation largely unaware of the crimes being carried out throughout the world in their names. While we understand these are difficult times for students as they prepare to go out into the world and work to support themselves and their families, we always start each visit with an essential word, which we ask the students to think about throughout the presentation and discussion. And that's morality, knowing the difference between right and wrong and what to do when you know something is wrong. If you have questions or comments you wish to share with the veterans, please submit them via the chat or on Facebook. I will keep track of them and raise them to our speakers. Our program is offered to schools free of charge. We often get inquiries asking what the fee is for the visit. There is none, which makes it possible for teachers to bring us in without having to go through all kinds of bureaucracy and or lack of funding. This is a big deal. The speakers all take time off from work, from studying, from family responsibilities to do this. Under usual conditions, when, for example, we do visits in the New York City metropolitan area, pre-COVID, when we actually went from class to class, school to school in person, each veteran had to make plans to spend a full week in the city, usually in housing provided by generous supporters, leaving their own homes for the week. Now they take time off from home during the day or evening to engage in remote discussions. They receive small stipends for their time. We are always trying to reach more educators and that takes money to pay for advertising. And when we do get to schools in person, we distribute materials to the students. I know a number of you have already contributed to our 2021 fund appeal, but if this program is to continue to grow and reach more young people, we need the help of everyone. This is a very memorable meeting for all of us as you get to meet these presenters and we all get to hear your feedback. It's also a unique experience for the We Are Not Your Soldiers World Can't Wait crew as we haven't ever all met each other in person or at least in virtual person before. And these five speakers are very special. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands who have undergone similar experiences and certainly others have reached similar conclusions about the nature of US war making. But there are not many who can speak openly and honestly with students and, and can encourage those students to feel free to ask whatever questions they have and to freely state their opinions. Speaking tonight are John Burns, Will Griffin, Miles Megasythe, Lyle Rubin, and Joe Ergo. And again, I'm Stephanie Rugoff. We are not your soldiers coordinator and tonight's moderator. I will now direct the initial questions to these five veterans who do the school visits with We Are Not Your Soldiers. Okay, I'd like you to start with what you do during your classroom presentations. What are your goals when you go into a class? And please tell us about any special personal experiences you've had during those visits, some things that really stand out for you that motivate you 
to keep on doing this? And who would like to start? Um, well, Miles. Hello, my name is Miles Megasif. When I go in the classroom, I say that. I say, hello, my name is Miles Megasif. I say my Megasif means mental energies gather and circulate in positive harmony. And I am an MC, I'm a father, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. And I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps from 1992 to 1996. I was in um, 3rd Battalion, 8 Marines. Um, I deployed to Cuba for one year and Okinawa for one year. Other than that, I was stationed in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And today I'm going to rap for you. Uh, I'm a rapper. I write my own songs. I've been writing for years. I was taught how to format my raps in the Marine Corps by a fellow Marine. And I became disillusioned in the Marine Corps. So I'm gonna share raps with you that you've probably never heard before. And you can follow me online and you can ask me any questions at the end of this session or during this session about my raps or about my Marine Corps life or anything you want. And that's what I say when I go into the class. Um, my objectives when I go in are to get one person to say thank you for helping me realize that I got to change my mind. Um, I think that's honestly like my, my objective. Um, I just go in to be as honest as possible. And I've found that, uh, I think, I think my honest objective is to just be raw, to be real, to, um, to be vulnerable. And I think my most memorable moment has been thanked has been receiving thank you notes and, and cards for that particular thing um, to be vulnerable in the class. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I can't explain what it's like to go into the class and talk to the young people. Um, it's just very emotional to think about those times again and remember them and share the experiences. And so it's, uh, it's always a it's always a very cathartic experience. I can go next. Go ahead, Joe. Um, my name is Joe Ergo. I was um, in the U.S. Air Force from 1966 to 1970, with one year in Vietnam. Um, I served in the, in the U.S. Air Force Security Police on the perimeter of Thompson Hood Air Base. And it was in 1968, the attack on my base changed my life. So I go into class to meet the students and I have several goals. I want to tell the students the truth about U.S. wars and about U.S. military history, not just in the details, but in the larger picture of how this flows from and is determined by the economic and political system that runs this country. I also want to connect to students' lives. I want to connect students' lives to the people that we are killing and people that we are invading and bombing. American lives are not more important than other people's lives, is what I say loudly in the class. Nowhere in American culture do the people we are killing and bombing matter to Americans. You can read the news carefully about the latest village we bombed somewhere and ask yourselves, did you learn something about the people who died or the family who was terrorized in a night raid by US troops that left several quote casualties? I also wanna show that the US promotes freedom and democracy worldwide. That is invading and occupying countries, bombing villages, etc., in order to maintain global domination. And there's a real need to get clear on this right now after the past four years and the election. Because as Bob Avakian, the leader of the revolution says in his New Year's statement, there is no question that many of the policies of the Biden-Harris administration will be different than the blatant atrocities of the Trump-Pence regime. 
things will definitely feel different with Biden Harris, but the way they will try to unite the country in line with the interests and the requirements of this system of capitalism, imperialism, is something that no decent person should want or be part of. And you can find the complete statement on Revcom.us. Most of the youth have been trained to say thank you for your service, to expect veterans to tell them war stories or to tell them about honor and sacrifice. Many of these youth have family members and friends in the military and have even plans to go in themselves. They only want to think of them as heroes. And I tell them, you need to find out what the service was about, that, that that service was about, and you need to condemn it if it was murdering people, whether it was up close or from a drone long distance. Veterans who regret their actions need to be supported, as also the soldiers who follow their conscience and refuse to take part in crimes. Teachers might expect that I am going to talk about the alternatives like college like going to college and encourage their students to plan on getting a job instead of enlisting. But I don't focus on any of that. Rather, I challenge the students on morality and politics to think about US history and the realities of the world we live in. I try to connect to students by talking about my personal history growing up and during my time in Vietnam. This connects me to them and their relatives and friends because I had all the same reasons for joining the military like they did. But I also tried to figure out how do I explain to the students in a real way how the military turns us into baby killers. And I know that shocks and upsets many people watching tonight to think of veterans that way. But all you really have to do is listen to the Winter Soldier investigations for explicit talk about killing children deliberately. And there will be a webinar on March 12th on the, 20, on the 50th anniversary of the original Winter Soldier investigation. I make this very real in class by talking about basic training and how, as Sergeant Martin Smith has called basic training, structured cruelty. It is designed to produce an unthinking and unfeeling soldier who follows orders and is an efficient killer. The military does not care about your hopes and dreams. They want you for only one reason, to obey orders and to kill. And even that crook, that cook on a ship or being in the motor pool is part of that killing machine. This is what I talk to the students about. I try to take them through the brutal process of brainwashing that is basic training and try to connect them to it personally, to what their friends and relatives have gone through and what awaits them. I also talk about racism, how racism and misogyny are absolutely a key part of the training. And yes, this is with the military, that has a high percentage of black and brown youth and women joining. Finally, I talk about the 800 bases, hundreds of satellites in the sky, and one of the largest armies in the world that is all across the globe to protect what the presidents and the media spokespeople call our interests. The sweatshops in Bangladesh and Vietnam make our clothing. The minerals like coltan that come from Africa, which is essential for our cell phones the coffee from Guatemala, and the flowers from Latin America. This is what is meant by protecting our, our interests. I also hand out to the students several maps about the 800 bases and another map that is a list of all the countries the U.S. has invaded since its founding. We also use video excerpts from the Winter Soldier films that is very graphic, and also the collateral murder video from Iraq that was released by Chelsea Manning and WikiLeaks. And one class stood out in particular with a high, high school in the Bronx, mostly Dominican students. And um, at, at one point in the conversation, I talked about the invasion of the Dominican Republic in 1965, which most of the students had never heard of. And even the teacher was surprised by the graphic details about what the US did during that time. But the, it was during the Q&A afterwards and the questions that came from the students. And one young Muslim woman, woman came up to me afterwards and she touched my arm and she said, are you scared? She was very emotional, but she realized that what I was telling them was something dangerous. And that really touched my heart. Thank you.
Thank you, Joe. Um, who would like to go next? Lyle, Will, John? I can go next. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Will Griffin. Um, I really appreciate uh, We Are Not Your Soldiers project because it's one of the, I don't know if there's any other, uh, one of the few that still gets veterans uh, to tell their story and to share that experience with students. Um, so yeah, you know, I imagine a lot of people here have already been well involved with the anti-war peace movement for a long time. So I'll try to not say the same usual things the three goals that there's like three main things that I try to um, convey when I'm in a classroom. One is to share my personal experience. Two is to educate on U.S. empire. And three, really kind of ask the question, what does it mean to serve the people? Uh, let me just briefly go over these three. Obviously, my personal experience and, you know, this goes out to other veterans. Sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's hard to continue to share your story over and over and over, right? So I just want to acknowledge that. But we do. Um, and my personal experience was I was a paratrooper in the U.S. Army for six years. I was in Iraq when President Bush announced the surge. And I was in Afghanistan when President Obama announced the surge. So I got the best of both worlds a black and a white president, a Republican and a Democrat, and two different wars, right? Um, so I really share that experience. Also, you know, I am a person of color. I'm, I have a Korean background, and I talk about, obviously, the different nationalities and ethnicities um, and even genders within the military and my experiences with that. Not just in a combat zone, but in basic training, uh, in the barracks, wherever, for uh, the whole six years I was in. I also like to educate on the U.S. empire because, you know, I start off by saying what I'm about to explain to you students is basically trying to explain water to a fish. Like the U.S. military is everywhere around us all the time. It's ubiquitous. How do you explain something that you're just born in this is all you know especially students they don't know what a, a day of america not in war is like right um so i try to let them know the context of all that but i also do a powerpoint presentation and i show i try to visualize and really make the point that this is an empire right 800 plus military bases you know, I don't know, how, tens of thousands of uh, bombs being dropped every year, continuous, endless war for uh, decades now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, everything I try to talk about, I try to, I try to give them a class perspective, a class analysis, right? Because in the military, it's constantly, you are serving the people, you are serving the country, you are serving the people of the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and some, you know, some veterans still say, I served in yada, yada, the military, the Air Force or whatever. You know, I tell students that I don't like to use that word serve. I just say that I was in the military. Um, because if we are going to use that word serve, let's say that I really serve the weapons corporations, all the other hundreds, maybe thousands of corporations that sell the toilet paper, the air conditioners, the socks to the soldiers overseas, et cetera. These are the ones who made billions and billions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, right? the, you know, the, the politicians, um, the generals, right? Th these are people in a different class than the majority of people in the United States, right? And their interests are completely different than the majority of Americans. Um, especially these students who are mainly black, some brown, rarely white, low income, families and communities, completely different interests. Um, so I really try to ask the question, like, what is the role of the military? Who is the military actually serving? Who benefits from uh, this imperialist aggression overseas? Um, you know, in my city here in Philadelphia, kids don't even know that this is an empire because we got kids growing up in the hood. Um, they don't even know what 
you know, a functional school should actually look like. The heater gets turned off in the winter time. Uh, they're putting fans in uh, now for COVID-19, saying that that's going to help ventilate the air, and they want to do that in the middle of winter. Um, and while, you know, we're, we're funding this huge military industrial congressional complex all around the world. So that, those are the three things I try to share with the students. My personal experience, uh, realizing that we're in the U.S. empire, and then the class analysis and asking who do we actually serve. That's it. Thank you. I, I guess I'll go next. Um, first of all, thanks to Will, uh, everything you said, I, you know, I couldn't agree more. And, and same with you, Joe, both of you, um, you know, more or less said everything, um, a lot of what I wanted to say already. Um, my name is Lyle Rubin. I served in the Marine Corps from 2006 to 2011. Um, I, I know I just used the word serve, um, but I, I agree with Will on that one too. Um, I, I was in Afghanistan for a year in 2010. Um, and when I first show up in the classroom, um, I start off by um, saying that this is, you know, I'm about to tell you a story and this is my story. And I think it's, and it's not everyone else's story. Uh, we all have our own stories. I was, I, I was worked with a lot of people in the military who uh, experienced different things than I did or have different uh, perspectives on what we experienced together. And, um, you know, and I, I'm just here to provide one perspective. And I think it's, you know, we all have our own approaches, but I, I find that to be helpful because there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of brainwashing out there and a lot of propaganda. I think it's, I find that that kind of disarms people because um, a lot of people that are more skeptical, um, particularly young people, all they've heard or all they've seen is kind of pro-war. Um, to kind of begin with, with a certain level of humility. Um, I then go on to tell my story, um, you know, just kind of the basics, uh, why I signed up in the first place. Uh, in my case, uh, it was 9-11. I mean, there were a lot of other reasons as well, which I get into later on, but I start off with 9-11. Uh, um, I talk about where I came from, you know, like a upper middle class background, I because I, I I'd bring, I'd bring the class piece in, in later um, because I started off enlisted and I ended up becoming an officer. Um, and I talk about the differences between the officer ranks and the enlisted ranks. Um, and I finish with a scene in Afghanistan where I was part of um, basically the, the destruction of a corner of a village in the Helmand province. Um, and I, I leave, I, I, that's when I, I end the, the, my portion of the talk and then opened it up for discussion. Um, and it's really during the discussion where I bring in the politics. So I start off with the personal and then I kind of open it up to the political. And um, I often, I mean, we end up, I, I let the students themselves kind of lead the discussion wherever it wants to go, but there's usually a few themes that uh, we hit each time. Um, one of them is, has to do with connecting the inner and outer wars, um, the inner and outer empire. So um, I tend to both both myself and a lot of the kids in the classroom, as Will alluded to, a lot of the people we speak to, um, we, we we go to schools that are being targeted by recruiters. So a lot of times these are, um, you know, these these are students who come from poor working class backgrounds, students of color. Um, one of the most memorable experiences to me was uh, there's one experience uh, that I often return to. Um, I, I've actually gone to this school multiple times in the Bronx. Um, a lot of the students are um, migrants, refugees from Yemen, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, uh, from Libya. They're, they come from the very war zones that, that I end up talking about in the classroom. And now they're being targeted by recruiters uh, who are looking for um, people that speak the language of the war zones that the United States government has created and sustained. Um, so I think that's, a, that's just a very easy way to make connections between a lot of the violence, the social violence, the economic violence, 
the police violence that's happening in a lot of these people, a lot of these young people's own neighborhoods, own cities, um, and the violence abroad, and how those, you know, th those are used against, used to basically kind of recycle the system of violence. Um, yeah, I, I saw someone said grotesque. Um, and actually, I mean, as far as like one of the more fulfilling moments, I think that what was most fulfilling about those moments, each time I went to that school, um, you know, a lot of the, the kids would come up to me afterward and they would say, hey, I've gotten multiple phone calls now from the recruiter telling me I can get a signing bonus because I speak Arabic um, or I speak Farsi uh, or I sp speak Urdu or Pashtu, whatever the language may be. Um, and I'm not going to do it now because this is horrifying. And what's amazing is, you know, these are, these are kids that they, they come from these places. Um, and it still took people like myself and Joe and Will and Miles to kind of get them to think about these questions. Uh, I think it speaks to just the level of propaganda um, and just the, the level of silence um, in, in, the, in the media discourse um, and, and in, the, you know, in, in public schools and just across the board. Um, I also like to make connections between the personal and the political. So I often kind of talk about, you know, I, Miles was talking about being vulnerable. And I often make connections between, um, you know, why I joined up. In part, I wanted to become a man. I wanted to become strong. I wanted to defend myself. I wanted to defend those I loved. Uh, and I make connections between that need to kind of defend as a man uh, self-defense or defense as a nation um, with, yeah, with the connections between defending oneself and, well, you know, national defense uh, and this need to always be able to defend ourselves. Because um, I think, of, you know, one of the major reasons, I mean, there's the poverty draft, of course, but there's all sorts of other reasons. A lot of them do have to do with gender uh, that people join up, um, particularly boys, uh, aspiring men. Uh, so I like to kind of talk about that as well. Um, but I think I'll leave, I, I think I'm almost at five minutes now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Okay, John. Uh, I joined back in, I think it was 2007. I got out medically in 2009. Um, I went in as explosive ordnance disposal, uh, EOD. And uh, then I switched at one point to uh, military intelligence. Uh, my area of operation was East Africa. Um, and I'm not going to like repeat what anyone else has said because, you know, that basically the same reasons, you know, I wanted to serve my country. I wanted to make the world a better place. Um, you know, all the good things that you want to do. Uh, I found out shortly afterwards that that's not what we do. Uh, a good analogy uh, that I think of now is, you know, like I think Miles has mentioned this once before was, uh, I went in as thinking I was Luke Skywalker and found out that I was a stormtrooper for the empire, you know. Um, my ideas on things changed shortly after being in, you know, seeing people trying to kill themselves and, you know, like uh, having friends die. And then your command is just basically like, you know, suck it up, you know, type stuff. Um, these are the types of things that like students don't see. They don't, they don't see this, this type of stuff because it's over glorified, you know, video games, movies, um, everything is so pro war, uh, you know, like, what was mentioned before, it's a very uh, uh, groupthink mentality where people just kind of go with it. You know, when people say, oh, well, thank you for your service. And it's like, you know, you don't know what you're thanking me for, <laughs> you know? And that's, I try to explain that to people in the nicest way possible, but it's usually doesn't work out very well. Um, uh, one of the reasons I do these uh, 
speaking tours is because it is kind of a form of therapy for me. Uh, it's like one of the ways that I've dealt with, you know, some of the things that, you know, I deal with in my head every day. Um, it's important to get it out because, you know, keeping it, it's not going <laughs> to, it's not going to help anybody. So uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> I'll tilt the screen up a little bit. Um, <laughs> probably sit back more. Um, yeah, that's basically why I do it. Um, I want kids or students rather because we you know talk at colleges as well um i want students to learn to think for themselves like i always tell them at the beginning i'm like don't believe a damn thing i say like go look the stuff up because the things that i'm talking about they're readily available uh, you can get this information i mean the department of defense even releases statistics um so if you don't believe me you know go look it up but that's basically what i got um, i don't know if you want to transfer it over okay thank you thank you john um uh, before we go on i just wanted to mention that one of the um people that's um attending this event is david zeiger who's a filmmaker of sir no sir which is a wonderful film about resistance in the military during the war in Vietnam. And it's um, a film that we always suggest to teachers as a wonderful resource. And um, I don't know if David would like to say something before we continue. I just, I'm, thank you for, for mentioning that. I, I'm just really, I'm really uh, interested and moved by what you guys all have to say. Um, you know, it, it seems that that these wars, these ongoing wars today have become so distant from everyone. I mean, is, is, is that, I mean, are, how much are students even aware of what's happening, right? You know, of, of, of the continuing, you know, the wars and, and not just the ones that the U.S. is fighting directly, but, you know, Yemen and, I mean, all the, the, the drone you know, uh, wars that are going on, all of these things just like they've been very, you know, they, they, it, it's, it's a very conscious thing that these things are made so, you know, distant. I know that was always something that, you know, the military learned from the Vietnam War, you know, to, to try to both personalize the military and also you know, try to keep things uh, as distant from from the folks back home. As, well, I wonder if I, I'm, I'm kind of, is this something that you guys run into? I mean, I, I can imagine students today, I know students today, it, it, not even, it's usually now their grandparents who were part of the Vietnam War, not their parents. Um, so that's even become more distant. But uh, uh, what about with Afghanistan and Iraq and, and the other uh, things? Are, are you know, is there much awareness of these things? I can say something to that. Or Steph, are you? Um, well, I was, I was going to say no, there isn't. And I think there are two aspects of what we do in going into the schools. And one is to um, hopefully convince those who are thinking of enlisting not to enlist, but all the others in the class who are not thinking of enlisting, but have no idea really of what's going on in the wars and don't know all these wars are going on and don't know what's happening. It's, there's, you know, just as most of the society, not just the students, but most of the society is ignorant of what's happening. But go ahead, go ahead, Will. Yeah, thanks, Steph. Yeah, I, I want to say the same thing. Generally, the kids have no idea. There's a few, maybe college students, maybe uh, that may know a little bit about this stuff. But generally, like high school students, and especially in low income areas, absolutely not. And just to give you, an ex, you know, some of the things I know outside of doing this, I know some teachers here in Philadelphia, and a lot of the low income communities of color, students of color, in high school, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, have a third grade reading level. Like that's what our public education system is doing in the 21st century. 
uh, in the belly of the beast, right? Uh, you know, anyone with a third grade reading level is not going to pay attention to foreign policy. And if they come from a community or a family that is struggling with a single parent and or uh, part-time jobs, COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera, you know, what's going on 10,000 miles away is the least of their concern. But also, yeah, the propaganda, because they do know everything about Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. Uh, you know, the latest music that's been coming out, et cetera. You know, everything about these celebrities, uh, but nothing about, you know, the political structure, uh, the economic, uh, you know, disparities that we have in this country, et cetera. Well, one thing that I just want to mention that, you know, that can at least be, you know, helpful to some degree is, is there's, there's been a move uh, this starting last year to uh, re-release both um, Sir No Sir uh, and um, FTA, which is the film of the Jane Fonda, Donald Sutherland anti-war troop that that traveled uh, all over uh, all over the U.S. But then the film is about their their trip to to uh, the uh, Japan, Okinawa, uh, the Philippines, and just these incredible scenes in this film of thousands of, of uh, Marines, Navy, Air Force, and GI, and, and, and Army, you know, cheering these, this very blatantly anti-war um, uh, production that they're doing. Um, and I've no, I, it just, one of the things that unfortunately I've, I've seen in high schools, and just generally is, it, is the, in, to the extent that Vietnam is even mentioned, it's almost always uh, the big lie about how the anti-war movement, you know, vilified uh, veterans and and uh, which the veterans were treated, you know, so uh, so poorly and and more importantly that that soldiers and veterans were not part of the anti-war movement. And I, in it, it seems like every generation is is fed that lie and it still has a has a lot of um a lot of power and and a lot of need to be uh contended with and i that you guys are doing you know a really important job in that well taking off on that um and knowing the importance of getting into schools we hope that people here will reach out to your high schools and colleges and ask them to invite us to speak to the student and students. And you can do this easily, even if you're not a student. If you are a student, speak to your teacher or your professor, but a parent can make a request to the school, to the teacher or counselor or administrator. Um, the person who you make the request to doesn't have to necessarily agree with us. Um, or have the same point of view, but they have to understand the gravity of the situation, which a number of people do, even though they don't have the same point of view, and to understand that a good education encourages critical thinking, which means that the students have to hear varying points of view. Um, so an outreach can be done by community members as well, even if you're not a parent or a student, or a teacher yourself or a professor. Um, Barbara Walker of Peace Action has been exemplary in reaching out to local high schools. She's called, emailed, and visited and created ongoing relationships with faculty and administrators in her community. She's been persistent, extremely persis persistent, and as a result we've visited schools in her community. So Barbara will say a few words about that now. Go ahead. No, all right. Mainly, I want to thank you for what you you do, the veterans. Um, it's so needed, and I don't think about it. Um, when it's whoever said it's like having a fish and explaining water to a fish. We're just living this, and so many are unaware of what is actually happening. Uh, this is an aside. There's something I saw years ago, and it wasn't here. It was in Vienna, 
in a museum and there was a picture of a man leaving in, in Afghanistan, leaving home of a morning with his gun over his shoulder and saying goodbye to his children and going down. You could see he was going into wherever it was. And I've never seen anything like that here. I mean, we're just totally unaware of what we're doing to people. Um, let me talk a little about what I do, where, where I do it. Um, since 2014, I've been in touch with several schools, um, encouraging interest in the World Can't Wait program of veterans visits to, to high schools. Um, while some administrators um, will listen, they will say that they don't have, their, their students don't have a problem with recruitment. Um, but some do show a bit of interest. Uh, giving hope is that um, there is a JROTC that has welcomed the veterans' presentation sessions, uh, the telling of their experience and the question and answer uh, period. Usually what is found is that there's just not enough time, more time is wanted for this. What I describe here can certainly help interested but busy departments include this kind of program in the semester schedule. Um, for a few years, and it was a few years, communication with an assistant principal was by telephone and email. There was interest in the program of having veterans come into the school, but never was a program established. One day, unable to get through by telephone, I went to the school and spoke with a school secretary. And to make this short, what she did was she got in touch with the assistant principal and with one of the teachers, and together they organized a visit. And within a month or so, there was a visit of a veteran to that particular school. And what it shows is that the, the, the administrators are very busy, one understands that. Um, but what is needed is the, the channel of someone who can coordinate and make it feasible for an interested school to have the veterans program take place. Um, so principally, the, this is, it's a matter of, the, um, of taking another um, source to make it possible for, as I say, a busy school, a school administrator to um, allow someone else to do the, um, the footwork. Okay. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, okay. I, um, in what all of you have said, the five of you, um, you all kind of um, spoke to dealing with racism and misogyny in your, when you speak to the students. Um, and there's certainly major issues in society today. Um, would you like to give um, some of the examples that you've talked about in your presentations when you've talked about racism or misogyny? Yeah, go here. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways I try to bring it out into the class is how um, the racism and misogyny is actually a, a, a fundamental part of basic training. And one of the ways it comes out is in the Jodis, it's in the songs that are sung, the marching songs. <clears throat> and there are lyrics that are particularly racist and misogynist. And, um, you know, look at all the children down there, look at all the people in the square, mow them down, mow them down. Um, there's a, another one that was popular, po quote, popular during Vietnam. It's called Napalm Sticks to Kids. And it is still used in basic training today when a, one of the people in one of our classes, a college class, was a, a former member of the military. And he said, yeah, we used that too recently. So that's one way it comes out. And the other way it comes out is in the constant denigration of um, the people of the world, the gooks, the uh, slopes, the zips, the ragheads, um, the sand niggers. All these terms are used against the peoples of the countries that we're going to invade and kill. Thanks, Joe. 
Does anyone else want to speak to that? I know you all do in your talks. Um, yeah, when I said I rap, so I do it with my rap and I, I speak to it in my raps. So I, I do um, Rise, the second verse of Rise is um, the horrors of global war, the saga of dominion of man over man in his fight over religions, over women, over children, over land, or the killing of the villains is dwarfed by the number of civilian lives lost collateral damage they name the cost and personal titles help dehumanize the loss so we protest wars but keep supporting their cost our tax revenues go to the war machine boss on his gilded horse expensive suit and tie blood money filled briefcase legal at his side with the eagle on his eye so much evil in his eye he cannot see that palestine suffers apartheid so i ride for the freedom of gaza to this beat of rise on the legion for a peaceful defeat my allegiance won proudly never discreet it's a bad of honor to be with veterans for peace and um i know for uh, a lot of my elders my raps might go fast uh but the kids really latch on to them and uh and there's no misogyny no materialism and no militarism in my lyrics so that's some that that's striking to the to their ears that's not something that they're used to hearing and that sparks that conversation um we can always talk about the the violence uh perpetuated against women being normalized in the music and and the industry and um and the kids see that and they don't like it uh they really appreciate different forms of music and they often question why they can't get access to things uh like myself and and friends of like my friends that i that i'll talk about in the class and so that's always a way to talk about how the industry is intertwined, how the uh, how the the military industrial complex is intertwined with entertainment, and uh, and how they're being misled from from a young age. So uh, the conversations are rich, and often there's very little pushback. There seems to be like one one child who might push back, one youth who might push back, but. Um, the kids, the, the people tend to be open to it and uh, and open to the idea of these conversations because they've never heard them before, even when they have family who are in the military. So it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Can I add to that? Um, we could... Um... The, the, about the racist, the racist part also includes why you're in service. <clears throat> Yusef Kuminyaka, who was New Jersey VVAW, uh, wrote an incredible poem about how blacks were treated in Vietnam when they were back out of the field. Like he wrote a poem about Tudor Street, which Joe Ergo knows Tudor Street, I'm sure. Uh, how they had, uh, Blacks weren't allowed on white streets, et cetera, et cetera, and vice versa, where the prostitutes were. And Jerry McCarthy, another uh, New York New York VVAW, wrote an incredible poem about seeing a cross burning. Uh, there was a ceremony when things were up in Chulai in Vietnam. And there's all kinds of like incidental poetry. I don't know if it's ever been assembled, but uh, uh, David, you knew, uh, J Dave Klein was a good buddy of mine. And, uh, he basically had put together some of these poems to share with kids. That's what I had to say. Sorry, I said thank you, um, James, for sharing that. And please put your questions and comments into the chat and we will, I will get to those and bring them into the discussion. Um, but I just wanted to see if any of the others wanted to speak to what you say about racism or misogyny. And then I have some other questions that have come through. So, so just real quick, um, just to give one kind of example of, of racism at boot camp, um, and some of you might be familiar with this, but um, th during the bayonet training, so there hasn't been, I often ask the, the students, um, when was the last bayonet charge on the part of the United States military? And I, I give them a few minutes or, you know, about a minute to, to kind of guess. It turns out it was the Korean War. So it was 1952 or 53. Um, that was the last official uh, bayonet charge. Yet we spend hours on end, sometimes days on end, 
learning how to use a bayonet. And really what it's all about is dehumanization. And this is actually discussed in um, David Grossman's book on killing, uh, which I recommend if only as just a very honest uh, portrait of entry level training and, and the thinking that goes on into contemporary um, entry level training. But we would say we had a rifle in our hand with the, the bayonet at the tip, and we would say over and over again in unison, kill, kill, kill Haji, kill, kill, kill Haji, kill, kill, kill Haji. Uh, and I explain, you know, a lot of the students I speak to are Muslim, so I'll, I'll ask what, you know, does anyone know what the term Haji means? And sometimes I'll get an answer, sometimes I won't. But I, you know, I make it clear to everyone that it's a term of respect among Muslims, one who makes the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, uh, and then we've turned it into obviously a derogatory term. Um, another example uh, that I often bring up about the misogyny is when I was at boot camp, um, the women rec uh, recruits on the other side of the island uh, were used as a foil. So everything that was manly, that was masculine, that was marine-like, that was what we were supposed to be. And then the women recruits, they were they were pussies. They were, you know, they were everything that was unmanly. And if we ever saw them marching by us, uh, the hats, the, the drill instructors would always make sure to make a comment reinforcing that we're not like them, we're not nasty, um, we're not weak. Uh, and then, you know, they might, if, if they think one of us is weak, then they'll be like, hey, you should be, you should be marching with them. You know, obviously, you know, I mean, this is all obvious, but it's just, it's worth reinforcing that that's that's something that that, that is definitely played up uh, throughout boot camp. And then you, when you find yourself with um, co-ed platoons later on, um, the the dynamics obviously in these units are, are very um, fraught with all sorts of um, um, misogyny and and sexual violence. Um, so we we make sure when we can to to talk about the the level of an intensity of sexual violence in the military. Uh, we hand out materials along those lines. And then I also just try to connect these things to the broader structures that are at work um, in the military industrial complex. So it's not just a matter of sexual violence within units or racist entry level training. It's also that the, the, the broader economic order that's being reinforced through this violence is also very racialized and also very masculinized. So what do I mean by that? Well, the global capitalist system as a whole ultimately is about uh, continuing to reproduce more and more money, more and more capital, for a predominantly white uh, global northern elite, and it's about exploiting a predominantly non-white global south. Um, so it's you know I try to you know connect again uh, these more kind of low level you know uh, interpersonal or local forms of racism and misogyny and class violence with the broader structures that all these wars are really um, all about. Thank you. I'm going to jump in here. Um, so you've been hearing a lot of what has, is being presented to young people by We Are Not Your Soldiers and some of the responses we're getting from the students and we'll be hearing more about the responses soon. Um, this is all offered to the schools free of charge. Not only are the students free to speak up and ask any questions, the educators in schools who are functioning, as we know, especially those of us who are teachers or who are parents, the schools are functioning on extremely limited budgets. The schools are free to invite us in, but carrying out this program is not free. It takes money and we need, we need your support. Um, so I hope um, people will consider um, making a donation. Uh, we have, I'm gonna go on now to some of the uh, questions that have come in online. And I'm gonna combine a few questions and so um, speak to whichever question you feel you wanna answer. Um, one was, um, Noah's Lyle spoke about a particular incident um, which would um, be considered a war crime. And in the military, do you get any Geneva Convention training? Another question was, um, how do the kids connect their experiences, their everyday life to what the military is doing in other countries? And 
this has come up, especially um, recently with um, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and how they were attacked um, so violently and the talk of bringing in the military. And then another question is, um, how do we address the, be the so-called benefits that they're going to get from the military? And how do you speak to that um, with the students? Um, so if anyone wants to speak to any of those questions, please do. Yeah, I could. I got something I want to share, um, especially in regards to the Black Lives Matter um, you know, arising in, in less than the past decade, right? Uh, I, you know, and this is in line with the last question about racism. You know, I try to share a story about, you know, I speak with a lot of veterans in the anti-war piece left uh, communities. And, you know, I had a conversation with one who was in Afghanistan in 2014, right? What year did Black Lives Matter come to existence 2014 in Ferguson and the veteran I was speaking to is a white male infantryman right and he's in Afghanistan and he tells me this story about how when Ferguson goes up there's this uh you know there's big talk amongst the ranks and especially in the infantry units and there's a big debate Right. There's the very few who are like supporting the black communities across the U.S. And the majority of the infantrymen are like, we want to go to Ferguson. Right. So these infantrymen are in a combat zone already killing people, mainly brown folks, and they want to come on U.S. soil to go into Ferguson, not to help the black community there. But to stand on the side of the police so that they can point, they can do their job here on U.S. soil. Right. And I think that's that story speaks volumes. Uh, the only other thing I'll touch on is like the Geneva Convention stuff. Um, I remember having so little training that I don't even remember anything about it. I'll put it that way. Okay. I don't know if I received any Geneva. I want to jump in. I don't know if I received any Geneva Convention training. I don't believe I did. Um, the things I saw in Cuba are still with me to this day. I know that uh, the sights and the smells both. Um, and uh, and so I, I suppress them and I don't like to think about it. And the, the way we treat people who are seeking help, um, humanitarian aid is completely inhumane. Um, there's not a chance that we are uh, a peacekeeping force in anybody's, really probably in anybody's lives, um, certainly not our own. I say that every time I go in, I definitely talk about misogyny and racism and how it starts in boot camp with, with breaking you apart, breaking young men away apart from any feeling of defense for their mom, their sister, their aunt. Um, the way they talk about the women in your life is just, completely um, demoralizing. Um, I remember doing this with uh, Stephanie in 2019 for the first time, I believe, maybe the first time was 2018 um, for a week. And uh, at the beginning of the week, I thought this will be kind of cool. I'll be in New York and I'll be able to see all my friends, uh, like in the evenings, you know, after the classes, because I'm from New York. And after the first day, I think we had about five classes the first day. Um, <clears throat> I, I was so wrecked. I was so emotionally wrecked that I went back to my friend's house because I was staying at my friend Dialect's house and, uh, and just went to bed. It was like nine o'clock. Uh, um, I hadn't been in New York for two years. You know, I'm a father of two young children. It was kind of like, I was thinking this was going to be like a, a, a mini vacation almost. I was so, um, 
just gutted. I remember seeing her the next morning and I told her, I was like, there's no way that this could be done more than once a year, like this schedule. I already knew at the end of the first day. Um, and their beautiful organization, I, I, I second will on this, like I've never seen anything like this. Allowing me to speak these truths has helped save me um, as both a person and as a father. And they give us an honorarium uh, for our time, which, which I'm very grateful for. It helps with travel and stuff. Um, and, you know, my wife and I have been lifelong learners and we've been living hand to mouth until very recently. So I'm able to give back now. And I gave recently my last, my last honorarium, I gave half of it back. And uh, I think it's really important to give um, so that things like this can exist, can continue to exist um, because there's not enough, there's not enough around. So yeah, I just wanted to thank Stephanie for having this and thank all of y'all for being here tonight. Um, this is really, I think the past five years of my life maybe has been, have been, um, buffeted, I don't know if that's a word, but, you know, have been supported by this, by this form of outreach. So I just wanted to throw that thank you in there. Um, yeah. Um, Stephanie, um, can you hear me? Yes. The, um, there are a couple of things that, uh, there, there are veterans watching this who really need to understand that we need more veterans participating in this. That we don't go into the classes with the idea that, well, maybe it's okay to go in the military if you're gonna, if you're just gonna, you know, go in and go into the or something. There is no reason that anybody should be doing military, US military. And that um, there are policies that go on that's hidden from the veterans. They don't actually consciously understand, you know what I mean, that the, that the policies that get carried out day to day with officers present, you know what I mean, are, are thought of and, and okayed at the highest levels. And, and those are actually the structural way the war crimes happen. The other thing that's structural is the, one of the things that's structural is the misogyny. In not just in basic training and the way you're trained, but 25%, there's a reason why 25% of all the women that served in Iraq and Afghanistan were raped by their fellow soldiers. There are documentaries out about this. There's a lot of testimony by women speaking about it. But one of the things that people don't understand is that like in the Philippines, when the United States had bases there, um, those bases, the, the prostitution off the base was organized by the US military with US doctors present in order to inoculate the women with, for venereal disease. And that all around the world where there's active prostitution, it is actually organized by the US military in order to make sure that they keep the level of venereal disease down among their troops and, and that they have that service, that quote service available. This is how the structural stuff comes out in the US military and the policies they carry out. Okay, thank you. Miles, and thank you, Joe. Um, I just want to go back to one of these questions about benefits. Someone mentioned in their question that less than 10% of Iraq war veterans are getting their college paid for by their veterans' benefits, and the kids are being lied to about that as well. John, I know that you have um, a binder of research that you bring with you when kids ask those questions. Did you want to say anything about um, what you present when you're asked questions about that? Um, yeah, I just usually bring a binder on statistics of, you know, the fact that like one in three women are raped in the military or, uh, you know, the fact that like 22 vets commit suicide per day, you know, like statistics that you're not going to really hear from anywhere else. Um, uh, what was your, what was your other question before that, Stephanie? Um, when they ask about the tuition, 
about um, all the benefits they're supposed to get, and you talk about how you know people are sometimes dishonorably discharged or the what you have to do actually go through to get the full um, tuition benefits. Right. I believe because uh, a lot of people believe like that the GI Bill, for instance, isn't uh, that it's free. Uh, you in fact pay about I think it's a hundred dollars per month for twelve months. So you actually do pay for it. That's non-refundable. So if you were to say get dishonorably discharged for whatever reason, a lot of people are getting discharged for uh, because their command just doesn't like them. You know, so they'll find out some you know BS way to get them out, um, and uh, that deposit that you put onto the GI Bill. Uh, is gone now. Um, uh, the benefits, I, I mean, I, I have students ask me all the time, they're like, you know, like, what are the benefits of joining? And I'm like, you know, you <laughs> a lot of sleepless nights, so you become, I guess, more productive in the nighttime. I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of cons to it. And it's just, it, the cons outweigh the pros. It's like, what are you, like, what are you doing to get that uh, free college? You know, it's usually you're bombing brown people, you know, and it's just, I don't, I don't see the point in it. Um, it would be completely different if, you know, like a foreign country were trying to invade us, but they're not. Like people are like, oh, well, you know, freedom's not free. And it's just like, we don't we don't have to fight for it like it, you have your freedom like you know the patriotism just the blind patriotism it's just ridiculous um but i kind of went off on a tangent there um yeah the uh, the benefits of uh i believe if you were to uh go to college abroad so if you're in a different country and you're trying to use your benefits i don't know if it's like this now because i got out back in like 2009. But back then, uh, your benefits are reduced if you don't fill out like paperwork every single month. And you have to like be very diligent on that. And if you're not, then they can just continually lower your, your benefits. Um, and if you don't take a full course load, I believe it's like if you don't take consecutive semesters, uh, your payout for the whole college is like diminished like drastically. Uh, these were what I you know looked up some some time ago. I have, I have to recheck to see if it's still like that. But but yeah, it's um I, I don't anybody that goes in for college. I'm just like there's better ways you know. And then the people are like, oh, well, I want to serve my country, and I always tell them there's plenty of ways to serve your country without picking up a weapon. So I mean, there's plenty of people. You know, in your your current neighborhood, like you know, homelessness. There's plenty of homeless vets that need help, right? So it's like, if you want to serve your country, well, go do stuff with that, not killing, you know, in the name of uh, of money. So. Thank you. I'm gonna just jump back here. Something that came up in what Will was saying, but. Um, from your personal experience or from hearing from current members of the military or other veterans, what are you seeing now? Is it increasing or has it always been that way? The penetration into the military by white supremacists or other far right tendencies or Christian fascists, both in the ranks, among the ranks and among the top leadership. Are we seeing a change in this over the past few years or is it a continuation? Is it getting any worse? Is that question directed to me? Well, it came up sort of in what you were speaking about, but. Yeah, I could touch on it. I mean, I don't, you know, what was the latest, there was a study that came out a few years ago or maybe a poll that said a quarter of active duty troops said that they know at least one or more white supremacists in uniform, right? So there's at least a quarter of the military, which is huge. But generally, you know, I like to, like Joe said earlier, everyone is complicit in the killing and the 
and, and, and what happened, the military does overseas. But what I'm about to say is, I think there is a real distinction between combat units and non-combat units. You, know, you mentioned earlier also the leadership is mainly white and male predominantly white and male. Well, well, combat units are predominantly white and male as well, right? And like I said with the example earlier, the infantry unit that wanted to go to Ferguson, right? Like I, I was a mechanic, I was in a maintenance unit. And I think there was like fundamental differences in how infantry units uh, operate and how a maintenance unit operates or a medic unit operates. Um, and generally, brown and black folks who join the military tend to join non-combat units, right? Um, and I think that's the distinction that we should just really think about and how it people who are trigger happy that are racist as hell, sexist as hell, et cetera, right? Um, but I mean, in my personal experience, yeah, there was definitely white supremacists in a maintenance unit. Um, I don't think it was as bad as infantry units. I, I lived with an infantry unit while I was in Afghanistan, and I really saw the fundamental differences in that. But um, yeah, you know, I, and we got white supremacists everywhere, but that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> okay, did anyone else want to speak to that? Uh, Joe here? Yep, go ahead. The book that's re come out recently in paperback by uh, Kathleen Ballou called Bringing the War Home. And in the book, um, Blue analyzes the development after the Vietnam War, where the Vietnam veterans, the reactionary Vietnam veterans, the killers, the ones that were stone cold and proud of what they did, actually helped revitalize and restart up the Klan and the Nazi organizations. They became one of the big forces, 25% of the militias that were mobilizing in the 1980s and early 90s were made up of these younger vets. And then you come to um, uh, Timothy McVeigh and white supremacist movement in, um, that he was a part of and the blowing up of Oklahoma City. Well, that trajectory of veterans um, is what we see now, a certain force behind what happened at the Capitol on the 6th and what's been growing in this country is this fascist movement. In the military, Military Times had an article in November about a poll that was taken in, in July. And the Military Times is saying 31% of active troops witnessed acts of uh, white supremacy while they were in the service, that were in the service at that, that, that time. And that 57%, this is interesting statistic compared to 31, but 57% of minority soldiers witnessed white supremacist behavior. 5% of the soldiers that were in the military that answered this poll actually participated in Black Lives Matter protests on the side of the protesters. And um, so this is, this is an important thing that's actually not really being spoken to by veterans in this country. And I think it's gonna become important for us also to talk about this because the students are gonna bring it up to us. The polarization that's going on among some students in some classes is gonna get reflected in classes because they're hearing this stuff from their parents, the QAnon and all the conspiracy theories and all the reactionary um, racist things that, are, that they're, they're learning from their parents and their friends. I think we're gonna face that. So it's important that we start this discussion amongst ourselves. And um, I, I just want to recommend also people, if you heard me before, read that quote from uh, the New Year's statement by Bob Avakian. I think it's very important when he targets and speaks about the rise of Islam, of, of fundamentalism within here in the US, this right wing fascist fundamentalism and what it means and what it, what it means for the development of a movement in this country to actually bring about a different kind of society. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, okay, I, there were a couple of questions. I was looking at the questions and trying to see um, 
if we've answered most of the questions. Okay, there are two more that I'd like to bring in here. One is someone asked, and I think this has happened with a number of you when you've spoken in classes in the colleges, not in the high school, but when you speak in the colleges and there are veterans in the classrooms, have they ever challenged you or what happens? I mean, I, I could answer, but I think it's better if one of you answers. I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll try to answer another question that's come up a bit about going back to the question of benefits and, and more positive experiences in the military. I want to get to that as well in a second. But first, yes, a lot of I've had a lot of students um, challenge me, which which I think is great. I think the conversations are a lot more interesting that way and a lot more productive. Um, we speak to our junior ROTC groups. So we're speaking, at least I've spoken to, uh, I mean, over a dozen probably JROTC uh, classes. Uh, so these are people that are, you know, planning to go into the military. Um, so a lot of times they're, they're very interested in what I have to say. Uh, it's always been civil. There's never been, um, you know, real, you know, any real like rage in the room. I mean, it's always like, we always kind of go back and forth in a very civil way. Um, and all sorts of unexpected situations along the, I, mean, I remember one time, this was actually outside of a JROT, this is in a college classroom. Um, there was a um, ethnic Albanian um, refugee of the, the war in Kosovo and very appreciative of the US military uh, role in, in that, that war. Um, you know, so these are, these are interesting kinds of um, situations that crop up and I, I welcome that. I mean, I think, I think it's important to kind of get at the nuances. I mean, it's, I, I tend to think that the US military as a whole is, is an evil force in the world and I make that clear, but that doesn't mean that every moment of every day uh, it, you know, is just pure evil. I mean, it's, it's, it's a complex situation like anything else, but I think, I think we can hold two ideas in our head at the same time, that there are times where there's good things that happen in the military and there are times even when the US military has done a good thing here, here or there. But overall, the overall structures, the overall systems, the overall history is, is, a, is a history of domination and oppression and all the rest. And, and that's really what I try to uh, leave you know, the, these kids with is that, um, you know, uh, it, it's not it's not black and white, but with that said, um, there are systems at work that we need to start thinking about. Um, and this goes to questions that along you know benefits and 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 you know learning trades in the military. Yes, like I mean I know plenty of I know plenty of veterans that, that the military have, has served them pretty well. Um, they were able to use the GI Bill. Um, they were able to learn a trade that helped them. But overall, um, the, you know, the military is hurting a lot more people than it's helping, uh, both within the United States and, and especially without the, um, you know, beyond the United States borders. Uh, and I don't go into the classroom and tell people, hey, you know, you better not join the military. I provide them with stories and with facts and with histories that make, you know, um, compel them, propel them to think more seriously about whatever decisions they make, both when it comes to whether they're gonna join the military or not, but also you know, if they're gonna start voting for certain politicians or not voting for certain politicians, if they're gonna start showing up for anti-war protests or not showing up for anti-war protests. So it's really more about just making, um, you know, making these young people start thinking about these issues. Uh, and I understand a lot of them are, trust me, I understand a lot of them are really in double binds uh, when it comes to their own economic social situation. Um, I, I mentioned earlier these students who not only do, are they offered these mi migrant students, refugees from the wars that we're fighting, not only are they offered signing work bonuses for their language skills, they're also offered citizenship. Um, the Green Guard holders, Trump temporarily stopped this program, but throughout most of the war on terror since 9-11 and even before then, uh, green card holders were um, allowed to join in the mil join the military. In fact, the military was actively recruiting, um, you know, pe people that spoke other languages because because of their language skills. So it's I, the the point I like to really emphasize is that like the problem is the system. The problem is that we these these are the choices that these young people have, and 
you know, we, we, we need to come together to provide better and more humane choices. And that requires a politics. It requires uh, an anti-capitalist politics, an anti-imperialist politics, an anti-racist politics, um, you know, so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. I've also noticed as I'm sitting in some of the college classrooms and you guys are speaking where there are vets that many times they also are sitting there and nodding their heads along and, and agreeing, but they don't, except in one rare instance, which was when John and Joe were speaking at a, a college where someone got up and actually then went with them to the next class and spoke there. But um, generally, they nod and agree often, not always. And that was a particular incident also what you're speaking about. Um, but they don't want to say anything. Because this, as you know, it is hard to say anything about this. Um, OK. Um, this sort of, we, well, there was a question also about what handouts we give to people. And one of the handouts relates back to the question of misogyny. We almost always give out a, a brochure from War Resisters League about women in the military, which has a lot of facts and information in there about what happens to women in the military. We have res a, a sheet with resources where um, students can go to get more information and some actions which they could take, suggested actions that they could take if they want to become part of an anti-war movement. Um, I'd like to ask you one more question here. Um, how do you see recent current US military presence in both its aggressive actions and its many bases around the world, both during the Trump administration and now as the Biden administration is getting underway? Uh, who would like to speak to that? Stephanie, can I can I ask you to clarify it? Can you just say it one more time? Just um, who current military aggression? What did you? Well, what do you see as you know the role? Is there any change in direction or what's happening now mm. with the U.S. military presence? Is it mm. becoming more aggressive in certain places? Um, what about the bases around the world? Is there you know what was happening under Trump? Is it do you think it's going to change under Biden? Mm. I always make a point to say that the same things that have been happening uh, under this administration were happening 20 years ago, because that's when I was in. I was in in 88. Uh, I mean, I was in from 92 to 96, which is, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago. And when I go in and I speak to the students, I've never had pushback from anybody. There was even one instance of somebody who agreed with every account I gave of Marine Corps boot camp. And he he was in, he was a post 9-11 vet. So he was in, he was in at least 13, 14 years after me, after I got out. And he, um, he put the stamp on everything that I said that they do to us in boot camp. So, um, and I mean, it's just, yeah uh the same the same policies that are being that are that are being enacted now on other countries have been getting expanded 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 for the past 40 years and so you can just give multiple examples of all the different countries that we're in war at and um and just push the students to do the research and it's it, it's kind of it's it's something that can't be argued. Thank you so much. Um, it's something that can't be argued. It can't be, you know. Um, nothing's going to change, unfortunately. And they're they're war hawks, both of them, anyway. Yeah. Can I add? Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, I see Trump as the right wing of imperialism, and I see Biden as the left wing of imperialism, not left wing in, the, in that sense, but uh, the more liberal form. Um, you know, basically, the policies aren't going to change. The military budgets are going to continue to be funded and, and probably grow. Bases are going to be maintained. Wars are going to be continued. Uh, and more funding to war corporations are going to continue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I want to mention, and back in the Obama years, when Biden was vice president, the pivot to Asia began um, with a little bit more extra effort. And, you know, that was mainly a Democratic Party thing. Hillary Clinton, Obama, Biden, et cetera, really pushed that. And they were able to push that because Obama came in pro promising to end the wars, et cetera. And a lot of the, you know, I wasn't there at the time and I've heard veterans in the anti-war movement um, say like, yeah, Obama came in office and the anti-war movement like pretty much died overnight. Um, and so I wonder what, you know, what the masses of people are going to react with Biden coming in and say, we defeated fascism, et cetera, by voting and whatever. Um, I don't believe in that line. But Biden was vice president when the pivot to Asia happened. And guess the two biggest economies are the Chinese economy and the U.S. economy. They're going to butt heads at some point. And really, that's kind of the point of the pivot to Asia. And you got China building in the South China Sea. You know, that's a major trade route for China that it heavily depends on. So I'd be curious to see what Biden is going to do in the Asia Pacific or what they want to call it now, the Indo, uh, Indo China, because they want to change the framing of all this because that pivot of Asia caused so much of a stir. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But really, imperialism will continue under Biden. Any, anyone else want to add to that? Okay, then it is past 930. I'm going to answer one other question. Someone asked, are we going into schools during COVID? No, we haven't this year. This school year, we have not gone into schools. So we're not getting to as many schools as previously because school teachers and students are having a really hard time with remote learning. But we are going to some schools and we do it all remotely. So um, we have, we've done since the lockdown, we've um, visited, I think, 27 classes. That's not as many as we usually do, but it's quite a few and we have a number of classes coming up. We have um, visits scheduled for next week and the week after that. Um, so we are visiting and we can go anywhere remotely. So if you want us to come to a school, someone was asking about Los Angeles, no problem. We will go there. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for um, coming tonight and um, help us reach more students. You can donate on our website. There's a link there with information on wearenotyoursoldiers.org and visit our website. Um, you can also do what um, Barbara Walker was exemplifying, go into your community speak out, speak to your local high schools and colleges, to teachers, professors, administrators, guidance counselors. Um, and I want to thank the team who put this event together tonight, Deborah Sweet, the World Can't Wait director, and Richie Marini and Jay Becker, who are longtime World Can't Wait and We Are Not Your Soldiers activists who have been working on the technical aspects tonight and keeping that working smoothly. So thank you, everybody, and we should all stay in touch. Okay, good night.